your Mufasa in the sky is being able to ask yourself questions or have someone ask you questions. So when someone says, this is the cost of doing business, it's supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be terrible. My question would be, who taught you that that was true? Ooh, that's like, really? Because you, you, you create what you believe. So who taught you that that was true? to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the marvelous Isaac Ho. Isaac Ho is a master sales and mindset coach and sought after health expert who helps entrepreneurs double to triple their income while having peace and ease inside and outside of their business. His clients routinely sell $20,000 to $50,000 packages, and he helps clients make more sales by transforming their mindset, emotions, and well-being. Isaac started helping clients at 17 years old with their health, and his drive to help clients led him to study with instructors and doctors in France, New Zealand, Mexico, Australia, and the U.S. But when he started to feel burnt out and overworked, he decided to redesign his business and sold his first $18,000 paid in full coaching package. That's when he started to help clients repackage their offers and sell high ticket. His mission is to move entrepreneurs out of overwhelm and fatigue, fall in love with the service they provide, and create a lifestyle of freedom and joy. (sighs) <sighs> Hi, Isaac. I got a question for you. What do small business owners need to focus on this week? This week, they need to go home, dig out a VHS, and watch The Lion King. Okay. And they need to make sure that they're not running their business, eating grubs, mm. and they're stepping forward as the true kings that they are. So we're not slumming with Timon and Pumbaa anymore, guys. We are going straight to the bigs. We are storming Pride Rock. We are taking it back. And then yep. what did you say in the pre-chat? We're having zebras bow to us, and then we're eating yeah. the zebras. And then yeah. we're eating the zebras. That's right. Eating the zebras in like three bites. I I love that idea. And, and I also um, thank you for representing our generation by telling everybody to go home and get a VHS. I actually have a working VCR and a VHS of The Lion King. So I can actually do this homework. Uh, my I have my grandma's like nine inch TV from like 1992 with the built in VCR. So I'm still rocking that thing. The day that dies, I'm going to have a problem. Yeah, hold on to that. It'll be worth something one day. Maybe. I mean, that's what we said about Beanie Babies. So let's see about <laughs> that planning out. But uh, so what's this thing? What's this thing about like, make sure you're not eating grubs. I talk to my clients all the time about how easy it is to put yourself last. But when you're talking about not eating grubs, what do you mean by that, Isaac? Yeah. So it's really interesting, too. One of the things that you said was leave Simone and Pumbaa. But actually, the interesting thing is Simone and Pumbaa actually chose to come along with the king. Wouldn't you? But only only when the king decided that he wanted to go first. Yeah. Because at first they were like, we're losing him. And then they went, oh my gosh, look at what his calling is. I'm going to follow. Yeah. And that's really what, what leadership is in sales. And when Ooh. you talk about eating grubs, well, one of the things, if you know about, if you've ever met a lion, it's like, sure, a lion could live off of, they could make do with eating insects. Uh-huh. Lion, the king of the beast. I mean, that's yeah. a lot of protein you got to feed that animal. Right. And they're hunters. They're hunters. One right. of the things that that the the king always did was he hunted the wrong kind of animals from being in the pride land. Yes. So he was actually born to hunt. He was born to spend this energy. And mm. what Simba had become resigned to was he sat around, lifted a log, ate, and did not. He did not use his gift no. that nature gave him. No, he didn't. He became resigned. 
He did. He totally did. And you're so right about Timon and Pumbaa, too, because they very understandably are like, hold on, our BFF is a king. Bye bye. We're going to go over here and hang out for a while. Like, that makes total sense. But you're right. Simba had to lead the way. And I think a lot of the time in our pricing or in our strategies, heart centered business owners do have a very real anxiety, sometimes a crippling anxiety of leaving the people that have made them successful behind or leaving the people who believe them, believe in them the most behind. And to your point, why can't everybody go? Why can't we be the leader that takes them with us instead of worrying about abandoning them? Why don't we invite them to come along and elevate themselves as well? That's really that's really profound, Isaac. You're really drawing some gorgeous stuff out of a children's movie at nine o'clock in the morning. I'm impressed. <laughs> but, you know, one thing I mentioned in the in the pre-chat that I think is so interesting is that you are very famously devoted to this idea of high ticket and and boutique and keeping things intentionally small and thriving. And I, in the past, especially I've toned this down a bit now, but in the past, like I ran a program called the low ticket revolution because I was getting so sick of all of these people, not you, not you, not you, Isaac, all of these people that have like very little value to give that are suddenly like, I got to charge $20,000. And I'm like, for what? Right. But for all these other people, they were watching them doing that and going, I can't sell a $20,000 program. I wouldn't even know what to do. And I'm like, cool. Well, why don't you start with a $50 mini course? And they're like, oh, okay. Sell that to a thousand people, see where we go. But I've since pulled away from that a bit to include more methodologies, including high ticket, because I think you're right. I think if your business is going to stay small, you have to scale your prices up in order to be profitable. What led you? to this kind of personal devotion to getting those rates where they need to be. Yeah. For me, really, it was, um, I started very similar to you with a low ticket model offer. And so one of the businesses that I own is a health and fitness. And I started off as a boot camp. It's a health and fitness studio. And so I had this 2,400 square foot facility. I was trying to train 30 to 50 people. This idea you could keep pouring people into the same time block mm -hmm. and you would just basically be printing money. And that's what my business coaches told me. And then I got, you know, 50 people into a class and I went, holy crap, this is exhausting. Yeah. This is exhausting being on for 50 people and they're paying about $1.99 a month and they're all in clicks. And the biggest thing that hurt me was, and I'm someone who, who is I see problems often. Yeah. And so then not having the solution drives me crazy. Oh my God, me too. You know, I'll stay up at in bed at night and I'll just be like, man, why their shoulder hurt forever? Why did it never come back? Right. And I could not address those problems in a group setting. I'd see people unhappy with their marriage. They'd come in, they'd be super drained from their day, and then they'd beat the crap out of themselves in the yes. gym, in the boot camp. And then they'd be like crying because they hurt so bad. And none of the None of the things that happened before were ever addressed. And I became a therapist going, well, if I could yeah. treat the shoulder, if I could treat them, that would become, that would, that would serve them. And then what I found was still didn't serve them yeah, because they still had all these other things that were unaddressed. And when I was doing therapy, I booked myself out so much that I was working seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I was exhausted. I would I would not be able to hold my phone, Annie, because my hands would hurt so bad from treating people so many, oh, so many hours a day. Uh, and my wife would just look at me sitting on the couch, exhausted, and she'd go, is 200 bucks really worth killing yourself for? Is it? No. And I couldn't answer that to her because I was so attached to the money. Yeah. And the thing that set me free was being able to learn to release money by learning high ticket sales, because one of the things to be able to get high ticket sales is you have to be totally okay with not getting high ticket sales. Oh, heck yes. Oh, a hundred percent. If I'm trying to sell somebody a $12 book, I'm probably going to get a lot more yeses on a $12 book than I am on a $12,000 year long program. Like, oh uh, yeah. But to your point, I think, I think there's something in us that and I also love that you're a dude talking about this because I talk a lot about women and over delivering 
But I really appreciate that you're showing that this is not a gendered thing because I don't like to gender a whole bunch of stuff or pink wash a whole bunch of stuff. Like this is weird for everyone until you figure out how to best sustain yourself. And and it's it's so totally true where we feel it's kind of noble or or purposeful. We take pleasure or purpose from the idea of just running ourselves ragged. And then somebody like your wife comes along and is like, hi, I would like a husband and not a broken lump. And you're like, oh, I'm running my own business and how I'm treating myself is in my own complete control. Oops. <laughs> right. And then especially right. as a health professional, you're showing up broken to clients that you're promising to help fix. Like, ah! right. It's completely, completely dysfunctional. Mm -mm. And uh, yeah, and it's really interesting you said that, like the idea of serving other people before yourself. I mean, my one of my my mentors who I love to death and helped me open my gym at 22 and do all these things and have a brick and mortar. You know, I modeled him exactly. One of the things he did was he would train clients till 9 p.m. and then start his workout and he would train until almost 2 a.m. My God. And so when I met my wife and we were dating, I expected her to be available for that. And she had a regular corporate job. <laughs> and I'd say, hey, it's 1 a.m. It's 1 a.m. I just finished working out. Do you want to go get nachos with me? You know? And she was so tired. I would, like, engage with her and she wouldn't talk. And I realized, like, wow, she's got to be up in about four hours. Yeah. To go to Seattle. And I realized, like, I don't want that lifestyle. But I unconsciously modeled that because the person that I associated success with was actually following those kind of behaviors. Yeah. And I think in business too often. That's what what happens. And um, oftentimes, sometimes we model to go back to Lion King. It's like Scar told him to run and he's yeah. still running all those years later. The person he looked up to, mm -hmm. he didn't realize was giving him advice that was actually hurting him. I think and sometimes we don't really consciously think about that. Way back a million years ago here on the show, one of my dear friends, Keisha Butler Thomas said something and I like fell out of my chair. She was like, I think the thing with advice is that we don't remember that we don't have to take it. Ah! <laughs> ah! If somebody gives me advice, I take it immediately, most of the time, unless I know it's like mm. way wrong for me. Cause I'm like, this is a, to your point with Scar. This is a person I trust. This is a person whose success in part I'd like to emulate, but we're looking at it in terms of tactics and strategies, we're not looking at it holistically in terms of whole life, right? So I love the example you gave of when you were dating your wife because, A, I'm glad that it worked out and that you stopped making her eat nachos at 1 a.m., poor thing. But also at the same point, like, you were emulating how your beloved mentor ran his business and his business was the core of his life. That's not the life that you wanted. So you were accidentally emulating a life you didn't want to run the business that you thought you wanted. And I think a lot of us do that. I think a lot of us do that all the time, especially with marketing trends, right? Where people are like, I have to sign up for TikTok immediately because everyone's telling me to be on TikTok. Okay, if you want to be on TikTok or it's a good part of your thing, go ahead. But so many people are like, I have to do my 10 TikToks and I'm so miserable and I just hate this. And it's like, well, then why are you still doing it? They're like, well, so-and-so said I had to. And I'm like, but if it's making you miserable, surely in the entirety of the internet, there's a different strategy that you could try. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I love that, Annie. And it's really about, since I'm going to stick with the Lion King this whole talk, Into it's about it. understanding who, who you are. Mm -hmm. like the moment that Simba saw his dad and his dad said, remember, remember who you are. Who you that are. is when he was able to step into his greatness. Yeah. And so many entrepreneurs I see, they're trying to use strategies based off techniques and they don't know who they are. If you don't know the essence of who you are, how do you build a business? How do you market and how do you sell products that are, that are extensions of that? And, mm. and instead they latch on to strategies that they think are going to get them what they want. They feel totally out of alignment with them. They don't resonate with them. And then they struggle to have a business and they think, oh my God, this is just the way it's going to be. Yeah. We do like Simba. We get resigned to eating the grubs because we're like, all right, this is phrase I hear all the time, the cost of doing business, right? I hear mm -hmm. all the time yeah. from people about 
the the actual you know financial cost of doing business when people are like and I do this all the time like bitching about our ad cost like I don't want to pay Zuckerberg any more money but if I have to I'll do it occasionally every now and then that's the cost of doing business but I hear all these people Mm -hmm. chalk up misery absolute misery burnout doubt fear debt all of these things as the cost of doing business and I'm like okay hold on There's got to be a space between the truth that entrepreneurship can be and is a very hard job, right? It is a lifestyle commitment, but there's got to be space between that and I choose to be miserable for the rest of my life in the name of self-employment or small empire, right? So how do we level set and know if something resonates and is strategically viable or, or how do we, how do we prioritize these things? Isaac, what, what's the beacon? Mm -hmm. What's our Mufasa in the sky? Yeah. Your, your Mufasa in the sky is being able to ask yourself questions or have someone ask you questions. So when someone says this is the cost of doing business, it's supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be terrible. My question would be, who taught you that that was true? Oh, that's like, really because you, you, you create what you believe. So who taught you that that was true? The only reason you have that experience, because that's not my experience. And so you're creating that experience because someone taught you that that was true. You know, this whole I did not think that you and I were going to go into this today, but that's one of the things I love about this show is we just go where our beautiful brains want to go. Um. What's coming up for me today, you mentioned yours and and specifically on like the Scar versus Mufasa versus Timon and Pumbaa, it's, it's really kind of bringing up this idea for me of mentorship and the paths we follow and the advice that we take. And clearly you have a really good relationship with this mentor, this mentor you mentioned, you had to kind of retrofit it into a life so that you didn't have to exhaust your poor now wife, right? And and create something new for yourself. But I personally have, here's my tea spilling all over my own podcast. I had a really toxic mentor relationship. And so I think for me, when you say you got to ask the question, who taught you that? I can answer the question who taught me that. And he did not have my best interest at heart, even though he claimed to. Right. So 10 years later, I'm still unlearning a lot of the unconscious stuff that he planted in my brain. And I don't even realize it's there until I'm like, why am I being so weird about X and Y? Like, I'm almost 38. He made this big deal about my 35th birthday and how like huge I was going to be by 35. I spent my entire 34th birth or my entire 34th year on this planet anxious and my entire 35th year on this planet feeling like a huge failure. And I realized that I'm like, why did I put that on myself? And even now, as I'm approaching 38 and I love aging, please, can I be 45 tomorrow? I'm all for it. But like, as I'm going through all of this, even still, I get these feelings of like, well, I'm 38. I missed the boat. What? What? Most of my clients are 20 years older than me and they're killing it. But it's like, but I let that person embed weird scar shit in my brain. And he told me to run and I ran. So how do we reach out for mentorship or receive mentorship, but also maintain our own divinity, our own autonomy, how do we not wind up in kind of a unhealthy relationship with mentorship? Mm. Yeah. So for me, I had a mentor that I worked with for three years and I've had different mentors. When I wanted to be a therapist, I got therapist mentors. When I wanted to own a gym, I got gym mentors. Yep. When I wanted to sell high ticket, I got a high ticket mentor and I worked with him for three years. And one of the things that was really different about him and the way I sell high ticket is the way he taught me to sell high ticket Mm -hmm. is that the person that you're selling to and the person you're coaching, they have to make the decision themselves. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that means that if I'm coming to you and I'm transferring, let's say someone's transferring this idea, you have to be great by 35. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are they telling you you have to be great by 35 or are they asking you what are your goals for the time you're 35? What would be a success for you when you turn 35? You see the difference? Oh, completely. I mean, if he would have asked me that, I would have been in a very different spot for the last several years, right? But 
But he didn't. He said, you will do this or you will fail. He didn't say, what would it look like for you? So keep talking. I love this. Yeah. And and really what I look for when it comes to mentorship is how does that mentor think about, how do they think about the, the things they think about? How do they think about the things they think about? Because our thinking always creates our outcomes. And if we understand the base of how we're thinking about something, we'll understand the kind of results that we'll create. So this mentor that I had that was working out late at night, he was thinking about his business as his life. Yes. When I was thinking about my business, I was thinking about my business as something that was supposed to give me the life that I wanted. And that is when we really went different ways. Okay. When I became a therapist, I, I really admired the therapist I worked with because he was thinking about how do you get people better? How do you always get people better? How do you really spread this technique? And after I had spread the technique and exhausted myself, I asked myself, how do I be a healer who's in integrity with his own health? Oh, that was the question that I asked ah! myself. Okay, hold on. Here on TLTQ, we have what I call the tote bag moment. And holy God, that's a tote bag moment. Say that again. Yeah. How do I be a healer that's in integrity with my own health? Oh, my God. Healers in the audience, did that also just drop kick you right in the solar plexus? How gorgeous of a permission slip is that, though, to be able to say, guess what? I'm not showing up in integrity with my own health. Yeah, that's one of the, the hardest thing for healers. A lot of my clients that I work with, they are ticket therapists that want to learn to sell high ticket. Yeah, because they're so exhausted from over serving or there are physicians and other health professionals that want to move out of being burnt out, being in the medical professional, and they can't continue using the same way of thinking that's gotten them burnt out in their business, or they'll just have a business and be burnt out. I love that we're talking about this specifically today because I am in the process right freaking now of writing a speech about sales avoidance specifically for caregivers. And you've brought up therapists of multiple kinds and, and all of these different things. And I see a lot of therapists. I see a lot of nurses. And nobody in the world, if I was just going to take a guess, if you brought me the most sales avoidant person on the planet, I'd be like, are they a nurse or a social worker? Like immediately, immediately, because they have such a deep drive to give and foster and think so little, I'm being extremely stereotypical and vague, wide, wide brushstrokes here. But I think there is something for people like therapists who want to get so intimately, but boundaried, involved in the lives in these very intimate situations. How do we as caregivers, as healers, as lovers of people, how do we avoid falling into the trap of over-delivering or the trap of building kind of an unhealthy codependence with our clients? Mm. I, I love this question, Annie. Um, a lot of it comes from the healer's initial desire to be good enough and worthy. Oh, so, shit. Okay. So their initial reason they become a healer is they want to feel valued. If I could help people, if I could be a yes. caregiver... You know, I've had clients say, like, my parents were really sick. I took care of them. And then when they passed, I never got the acknowledgement for taking care of them. So now I just keep on taking care of people, hoping one day I'll be acknowledged. And they don't know this consciously. No. But I help them understand that. And then that lives in their business. And so their, their past parents who never acknowledged them are running their businesses. Yeah. Oh, my God. And so that, first of all, making sure you're not creating a business out of an unmet desire. Oh my because that's really, God. really toxic. Don't make a business out of an unmet desire. Tell me more about that. And also, are you going for some kind of a tote bag record here? I told you about tote bags and you've said like four since then. My God, how do we, how do we approach that with the right lens? So if I had a client and this client didn't get the result and they were just like, oh my God, I need you. Oh my God, I need you. And you mentioned people being reliant on their coach or their therapist. Then I, as the therapist, have to ask myself, like, what do I get out of engaging with this person who's not getting the result? Yeah. Because I, I keep coming to them. I keep giving them more support. So I must be getting something out of it because if I wasn't, I wouldn't be doing it. 
So do I get a desire? Like, do I have a desire to be needed? And this client makes me feel needed. And then they need to be relying on someone. I need to be needed. And we continue this dance. And they as long, if that's not recognized will actually create that client never being successful because if they were successful, they wouldn't be able to say they need us anymore. Right. I mean, we're basically helicopter parenting our clients at that point. How we can they be, possibly you know. grow if we're smothering them with attention? Right? Yeah, we could be. And so just asking yourself that question of, you know, what am I getting out of it? And, and also understand we're always creating the results that we're committed to. So if you're saying I'm in my business and I'm stuck selling low ticket, I'm stuck selling mid ticket, I don't have any team, I have clients that are a total headache, then at some level you're committed to that. Yeah. Because if you weren't, you wouldn't be creating it. That's so your understanding story. why you're creating it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and why you're creating it, even though it's not the story you want to tell, right? Like why we double down on it while begrudging it at the same time. Because I've done that. I let my own repetitive, I mean, and I have obsessive compulsive disorder. So when I tell you I can loop, ooh, baby, I can loop. But I allowed some some weird thoughts to kind of waylay me constantly. And all the while, I love this conversation because all the while I was always looking for the strategy out of a mindset problem, mm. right? And I think what I didn't realize to your previous point is that I was trying to fill my own need for validation, for praise, for being needed, for people thinking I'm smart or funny, whatever that is. Like, that's a very interesting, normal human need, but it's not a good value prop for a business. Mm -hmm. And I worry about that in this current atmosphere of entertainment focus where I feel back to the Lion King, we're doing a lot of Akuna matata and not a whole lot of working when it comes to stuff like social media because it's like, yes, your reels are great. I'm entertained by watching you point at things that aren't really there. But at the end of the day, is that going to make you money? Is that going to bring a client into you? I don't know. Maybe not. Are you are you dancing around in the jungle or are you storming Pride Rock to eat some zebras, right? So I think I think there's an any an energy management to go to last week's episode. I think there's an energy management piece here of are you expending your energy and stuff that's going to move the needle or not? Yeah, mm. yeah. That's the that's the real practical side of it. Is is that going to move the needle or not? And I think you know, to your point, a lot of people, um, like from a society standpoint, they just follow people. You know, so if they see everybody's doing these videos, they not they don't ask themselves, well, is this person actually making any money doing these videos? And is this person pointing at imaginary stuff? Like, yeah. do they have the kind of clientele that I want? Yeah. Is it actually working? Like, I, I think, and maybe one of the reasons why I was so anti high ticket for so long was that a lot of how high ticket is depicted, like, I don't believe that a lot of people claiming their six-figure months are actually having six-figure months. And if they are, I don't think that's profit, right? I think, not that I'm going to call bullshit on everybody. I know that there are a lot of people out there just totally killing it. But the majority of people that are totally killing it are not talking about how much money they made in their Facebook ads, right? And so one thing I really, really like about your website is that you're encouraging people to live a more luxe lifestyle, but it's not up to and including like, imagine flying first class around the world with your family. Imagine doing this, imagine doing that. But it's not you being like, I fly around the world. I'm awesome. You should be like me. You really stay in that place of modeling and encouragement where you're like, hey, are you eating grubs or are you eating zebras? Like, You could be dressing impeccably. You could be eating at all these fine restaurants and it's, you keep it about them. And I think my issue with high ticket is all the people that are like, be like me, I'm rich as shit. And it's like, ew, ew. Like, why would I want to do that? And I think especially with the people that come to me that have natural sales avoidance, they see that and they're like, I don't care about how much money you made yesterday. Get off your high horse, ew. And like, so how can we, 
show up as boutique, luxury, high-end business owners without looking like a Kardashian? Uh, uh, first, I want to address the mindset of something you said, which is really, really important. When somebody has a judgment, mm -hmm. like, you, that person made a bunch of money. Now I feel like, oh, that's disgusting. They made all that money and they're waving that around. That's usually their judgment of someone with wealth. And as long as they hold that judgment, they'll struggle to create money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, these clients that are coming to you that are like, wow, look at how they're waving all that money around. They're actually in judgment of the wealth. Mm -hmm. So what would they make it mean if they were to create that kind of wealth? <sighs> that they would be one of these people just like that. And as long as they hold that belief, they'll never create the wealth. Oof. So from a mindset perspective, that's the first thing mm -hmm. that you have to deal with. Now, one of the things that really helped me is when I had my health and fitness therapy business, I was maybe making about 200K a, a year, right? And I went, okay, this, this is cool. Like I can live off of this. You know, we have expenses, just mm -hmm. like you said. Yep. So you can make 200K as a business owner. It doesn't mean like you paid yourself 200K. No. Right. So I could live a, a good lifestyle. Now, when I met someone who was a solo entrepreneur, one guy in his company, high ticket coach, and at the time that I hired him, he was 60K a year. So that's 5K a month. And he had about 20 clients. So you do the math, that's seven figures a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. About 1.2. And my thought was he was going to be this obnoxious, mm -hmm. super egotistical, because I had all these beliefs about what I thought someone who made seven figures a year was going to be like. And then I met him in person. Yeah. And he was interested in me. He asked me questions. He was willing to be in truth about the result I was creating. And he called me out out of love in a way that no one did. Mm. And part of it was he Aww. did not need the money. He did not need the money, whether I bought from him or not, yeah. he was going to be taken care of. And that is what I want my clients to get to. Because mm -hmm. the truth that you have when you're working with a client as an entrepreneur, you can only share with them that level of truth if you're not afraid that if they leave you, it's going to hurt you. And if you do not have the faith in your own ability to generate revenue, you will start coaching your clients from a place of, I need to keep the client instead of what's best for the client. Oh my God. Okay. I know we're both happily married, but legit, I could kiss you right now because I just, apologies to your lovely wife, because it's, it's, I have people come to me and, and I teach re-enrollment, right? I teach lifetime value of the customer, of course, but I also don't have a problem when my clients graduate from me because that's what I want. I want my client to be successful. I don't want my client to be beholden to me for every inch they make. I don't want my client to feel like they have to come to a call before they make a decision. That's not good for them. That's not good for me, right? But I think sometimes we, we do have that kind of white knuckled feeling on the people that are currently paying us. Like, I must keep you near and dear to me at all times because I'll never have anybody else. Right. And so like that very much is kind of like scar in the hyenas where it's like, oh, we have to hang out here or we're all going to starve. And it's like, OK, well, hold on. Maybe if y'all left and went somewhere else that isn't an elephant graveyard, like maybe you'd be okay. But they're, they're so dependent on that status quo. They're so dependent on maintaining. And I think you're right. I think there's a very real doubt of like, if I let this client go, who's coming up behind them. And if you feel like your pipeline is going to dry up, you're not going to, you're not going to coach from that place of excited expectation of possibility, you are going to coach from that scarcity mindset. I never thought about that. You're so smart. It, experience, Annie, because I'd made all these mistakes. You know, yeah. I had clients where it was when I started selling high ticket, it's not like I came out of the womb and started selling 30k programs. I remember <laughs> when I started selling. Okay, just so everyone's clear. It's like my first when I first opened my business, you could have hired me for $50 an hour. You gave me cash, yeah. you know, I would uh, text you on the weekends and send you a birthday gift. So, yep. you know, oh I didn't, I wasn't God. born from, oh, from I high ticket. I scene in that. Although I do now have this yeah, lovely real... image of you like busting out of the womb singing, I just can't wait to be king. Like, here That's I right. am. Here I am with my high ticket glory. It's definitely, definitely my favorite song. One of my first high ticket clients, I'll tell you, because I had to learn to sell high tickets. So just, just to be clear, it's like I started selling high ticket as a health coach. 
And then people started coming to me and say, hey, how do you have health coaching clients at 20K a year? So then they said, can I hire you for business coaching? And I said, like, you know, I'm new to it. So I go, yeah. I was like, if I can help you sell a client for 20K, it's my first sales coaching client. I was like, you pay me 30K. That makes sense because you'll probably get two clients in a year, right? So, you know, you'll make 10K off of it. And that's how I really started doing business coaching. Mm -hmm. And one of the first clients that I got when I started doing business coaching, really interesting, is I'm sitting in this plane. My wife and I are flying to uh, Italy for a baby moon. Okay. And you know, when you're like, and I'm flying coach, okay, because like, I'm just kind of starting as a high ticket coach. It's not like I'm, I'm balling out. So she's sitting in the window and I pick the aisle because no one wants to sit in the middle. Well, the person sitting in the middle is wearing a Pikachu onesie. Oh my God. Yes. Wearing a Pikachu onesie. Okay. And she's got blue hair, Pikachu onesie. And I see her drawing on her iPad. Uh It's pretty good. And I go, Hey, like, are you an artist? Like my, my, uh, like my uncle actually, you know, worked with Disney and did the Emperor's New Groove and stuff. So I'm interested (gasps) because I I love art. Yeah. That's a, we can come back and talk about Emperor's New Groove. (gasps) So you know, I'm, I'm talking talking to her about her art. And she goes, no, I'm actually not an artist. She goes, I play video games for a living. Amazing. And I went, that is super cool, right? So I start talking to her. And then she actually tells me, she goes, like, I'm actually in cam porn. I play video games naked. Um, right? Amazing. Right. Good for her. Good for her, right? That's what I, I was like, wow, good for you. And we talk about it. Well, this lady ends up hiring me for $30,000 as a high ticket coach. Okay. So, on an airplane, in coach, on the way to Italy. Let that just show everybody that opportunity really is freaking everywhere. Yeah, with the right mindset, it is. Uh-huh. You know, And this is the thing I learned. And I'm sharing this story because here's one of the interesting things that happened. Is because I was new uh-huh. at client acquisition. Okay, I was practicing the skill set like I tell my clients to do. You know, I got this client, but she only coached with me for about six months. Mm-hmm. Okay, she didn't finish for a full 12 months. And part of the thing that she had is she had a thing around money and scarcity. And because I was new to it, I had a thing around money and scarcity Mm -hmm. because I just started selling at the 30 K level. So, you know, every time I was talking to her, it's like, Oh my gosh, if I can't help her steer off the cliff, Mm -hmm. that's going to cost me 2,500 bucks a month. And I was doing my best, but I wasn't as practiced as I needed to be. And so dealing with that fear around the money you know, that, but actually having the fear around the money and letting it express inside the sessions, that is part of what cost that client. And I'm not saying there's anything I could have done differently, mm-hmm. but after six months, okay, I wasn't able to continue working with her because I just couldn't get her out of that. And part of it was I held that inside of me. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm sharing this story because yes, it's cool that high tickets everywhere, but also knowing as you sell high ticket, the biggest thing that will get triggered is your need for money. Most people do not sell high ticket because they have a massive need for money, mm-hmm. triggers the shit out of them. Yep. And then when they go to work with the clients, they may sign them, mm-hmm. but within a few months, they lose the client because they're so focused on the money. You're right. Because we, I, I tell my clients all the time, get your price tag out of your own wallet, right? So just because you wouldn't pay $20,000 for your own coaching doesn't mean someone else doesn't need to pay $20,000 for your own coaching. But if I'm sitting there going, well, the money and my own money baggage, if I'm just vomiting all of that on my client, then I can't tell where I stop and they begin, which is one of the main reasons why sales falls down is because we feel this misplaced guilt that we go, oh, well, they weren't feeling it. No, boo boo, you weren't feeling it, right? Like I can always tell when I listen to a sales call, when someone gets on the call, assuming they're going to get a no. And a lot of the time it's when the price is high, right? So they get on the call and they're like, listen, I understand that this is an investment that you might not want to make right now. And I'm like, you're killing me, Smalls. (laughs) Right? Like, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Because we take our mindset crap, our money baggage, our trauma, and we just project it just straight up all over them. Right. So I, I could see in like your health business, if if you had an insecure thing about your health or your body and then you showed up in the gym and you were hiding while demonstrating, the client's going to see that. <laughs> right. Right. Which That's going to be so the obvious. Of like, how are you not in integrity with your own health as a healer? Like, How, as a business owner, are you taking your doubts and embedding them into your strategy? Ow! Stop it! 
Oh, gross. Well, I think another thing you said that's a that's a fantastic point too, Annie. Is when someone goes, "I wouldn't pay twenty k for my own coaching," we'll never sell it with that belief, and right. it's it's going to be an uphill struggle because they're going to manifest not being worthy. And one of the things that I know for certain is it is very hard to navigate someone through something you've never had to go through yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you've never bought a high ticket 60K program, selling a high ticket 60K program, it's never going to happen. So you have to be willing to invest and then learn what happens for you inside of you as you ask people for the money. And if you've invested with a coach at that level, one of the things that will happen is you will then start to understand what the value is of it. Mm -hmm. And then you should be able to at that point, or maybe you need some exercises if you're not, be able to articulate to yourself the value of why the high ticket is worth it. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the reasons why I'm able to sell high ticket is I know what each high ticket mentor did for me. Mm -hmm. I can articulate that. I know what it was worth. I know what I paid for it. And so there's nothing about the value when I go to ask for it. And so if someone's struggling with like, oh, there's no value in my work, Mm -hmm. then that's either a belief problem or maybe they haven't invested at the level they need to yet to really be able to say like, I'm a 20K coach and I've paid other people 20K and it's totally worth it. Mm -hmm. They need that in their own experience. So on that point, I'm Simba. I'm remembering who I am. I'm like crying in a field because my daddy's in the (laughs) sky. And I'm figuring it out. And and a good mentor, a loving mentor, someone, I love the way that you said this um, about the first real like high ticket person you yourself hired is that they called you out, but out of love. So I'm Simba. I'm in the field. I'm getting called out, out of love. I've decided that my prices are too low and that my business is not sustainable. I know I have some worthiness stuff I need to work on, but it's not severe. It's just the normal new level, new devil. I'm confronting something new. How do I know if I, as a provider, am ready or capable of having those high ticket offers? Like, how do I know if I'm good enough to offer a $20,000 package? So there's, two, there's two things we'd have to be clear on first, right? So one, what is the value that you bring to a client? And the second one is, do you have the sales skill and ability to close the client? Those are two very separate things. And if we're not clear about that, you could be totally valuable and you just don't know how to sell. And then what happens is you go, wow, no one will pay me. So it must not be worth that. And then they make that about them. So let's say that you have this, let's say you have the value. Okay. Now, if let's say you have the skill set and you don't have the value, let's take both. Okay. You have the skill set to sell. You don't have the value, then what you probably end up having is lots of cancellations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably have a a problem with signing people for 12 or six months and they cancel early. Yeah. If that's the case, then one of the things that you need to work on is your client fulfillment and specifically around how you're coaching someone. Are you, and this is the biggest hurdle I see, if you've never been holistically coached, you don't know how to holistically coach someone else. Mm-hmm. You're trying to focus on one area of their life and they have other areas that are stopping them from being able to implement it. And if you can't find out what that is and do work in those areas, you're going to have to either try to go around it or you're going to have to fall back into their old pattern of whatever they're currently comfortable with. Mm-hmm. This goes back to what we talked about, like in the gym. Yes. The person's in pain, pushing themselves, all these things, and they hire me just for health and fitness, we're not going to make any progress. Right. Because okay? to your point to... from before, they show up so entrenched in pain and so entrenched in their story that they can't really do any productive work because they're not really there to do that. They're there to vent. They're there to grieve. They're there to experience pain. Right. And so if you're like, yeah. cool, we're going to move the needle forward today. They're like, nope, sorry, not ready. Just want to sit here and talk about the experience of my shoulder pain right now. Right. And, and, And we're not saying dishonor the pain. We're not saying make them push through the pain and hurt themselves further. You're a therapist. You would never freaking recommend that. But uh, also at the same point, if you're not ready to work, you're not ready to work. What they really need is someone to love them enough to say, hey, the exercise is not right for you. What you really need is to make some lifestyle change and to hire a therapist to help you so you can heal from this and you can use your body the way it's meant to because you're not meant to be in pain. And they need that conversation. They need to hire that person that would have that conversation with them. 
I feel like all not. small business like LLCs or sole proprietor like legal things should just come with a mm. therapist. Like, congratulations, <laughs> you've incorporated your business. Here is your it's like a public defender. Yeah. Like, here is your coin yeah. appointed therapist. Here you go. Yeah. And then you'd, you'd have so many therapists that are just massively burnt out from being appointed to every business that they would <laughs> they'd be insane. <laughs> we perpetuate the same problem. We would just break all the therapists. Yeah, we'd break just... all the therapists. <laughs> right? That's but... right. Oh, that's God. that's the al- alternative issue. Now, if if you're like, okay, I'm really great at fulfillment. Mm-hmm. I just don't know, like I've never sold at this level. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then what you can do is you can go, okay, great. Well, how do I feel about that amount of money? when I look at it. That's really important. Like when I look at this amount of money that I'm about to ask for this up level, do I actually resonate with that amount? Can I actually look at the results that I've created and actually go, yeah, like that was, that's worth it. And that's an exercise I do with clients because if they don't know what the the value is that they're creating, they're going to feel really conflicted when they get to the number. Yeah. So assuming that, yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Yes. Just because kind of natural. I, you know, Grant Cardone in Seller Be Sold has this point that I make all the time, which is that if you get a money objection, you're not being clear enough about value. But I don't think until I talked to you today, it ever really occurred to me that maybe you're not being clear enough about your value to your freaking self. So if you have mm-hmm. a financial objection in your own mind about your own business, you're probably not clear enough on your value. That's right. one, of, one of the one of the things you said earlier that's so great, Annie, is you said you'll listen to a sales call recording and the person will create objections for themselves. Yes. Like, yeah, you probably don't want to sign up right now. That's probably too much money for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you may not be ready to make a decision. And so they carry these things inside themselves, especially around the price point. And then they'll project that onto their potential client. And then they'll go, yeah, I keep getting no's, Annie. <laughs> oh, my God. I just... Listen, I could talk to you for years about this. You have really, thank you for the gift of this episode because I think the way that you articulated things were so beautiful and I think are going to be really soothing. And I think you also, without trying to, called me out on love on some of my shit. So thank you, Isaac. I got two more questions for you before I go like sit in my bed and kind of happily cry and chew on what we talked about today. Uh, The first one, and Personally, I cannot wait for your coronation. Please don't eat me. But when you are properly crowned, I would very much like to be there singing Circle of Life, like down in the peons. I don't have to be up on Pride Rock, but like I would like to bow. So just let me know where I can bow and show my my due diligence. Right. So if you OK, what's my question? If you it's got to be Animal Kingdom and, and ridiculous. So we talked a lot about. Um, like kind of luxury living and boutique offerings and eating grubs. What is your cheap, nasty, guilty pleasure grub equivalent food? Like if you had to go back to when stuff was lean, is there something yep. from that time that you're like, no, nah, I'd eat that grub again? Hands down, Jack in the Box. I love Jack in the Box. Yay. Yeah. This episode brought to you unofficially by Jack, by Jack in the Box. Box. Oh my God, right? That's what we got to do. Big shout, out, big shout out to my boy Jack working hard in that box. He works Bring me that box. cheap eats all day. You know what yeah. though? Jack owns that box and he believes in his right to be in that box. And when he pops out of that box, he pops out with enthusiasm. Damn it. That's right. My next question is, I am I am Simba. I'm back in the field. I'm crying. And guess what? It's Isaac Ho in the sky. And Isaac Ho in the sky is telling me to remember who I am. And I got to figure that out. So if that's me, how do I bring more you into my life? Yeah. So you can text me. I have a specific line you can text. It's 66866. And you need to text the word and, A-N-D, and. So we can have a conversation about helping your life in your business, your health and your lifestyle. And it's really about having all three of those things, not just one. What are the three again? Health, business, lifestyle. Because some people have business, no lifestyle. Some yeah. people have business, no health. And the, I've had this problem myself, which is really why I'm called to solve the problem. Because, you know, my biggest, my biggest pain, I would say, in seeing entrepreneurs is they have this gift, they give this gift and we look at their lives and I look at my life and I go, man, my gift is my curse because I'm fulfilling, I'm working 
and I'm not living the kind of lifestyle quality or have the kind of health that I want. Mm. Health, biz, and lifestyle. Well, Isaac, you've certainly helped me with all three today, and I'm sure our listeners would feel the same. Thank you so, so much for being here with me today and for jamming out on The Lion King. And yes, you have to come back, and we have to talk about Emperor's New Groove. (laughs) Okay, perfect. I loved it. This was a lot of fun for me. Yay! Everybody else, I will be back in just a second with my final thoughts and your homework for the week. Well, hey there. Isaac truly is the king, isn't he? He shared so much in this episode, I actually struggled to come up with this week's homework. What was left unsaid? And how do we turn huge mindset shifts into action? One thing I see over and over and over with my clients and honestly with myself too, is that it is entirely too easy for us to downplay our value. We shy away from compliments, slash our prices at the hint of an objection, make excuses for failings we don't actually have, all to temper our bragging rights. And I'm in this phenomenal certification right now. And I swear we've already talked about nine different types of money trauma. So it's not even that hard to understand why this affects us so deeply. It's worthiness. It's value. It's also just compensation. We have internalized so much about what it means to be successful, to be whole, to be the kind of person who is capable of commanding a big fat fee. So today, your job is to go out and gather some proof that you are already delivering fabulous value and are ready to evolve to your next level. In Isaac's honor, I'm calling this the Can You Feel the Love Tonight Challenge. Namely, I want you to go out and ask for testimonials, not coyly, directly, not begging either, but genuinely asking. Your clients want to help you grow. In study after study, most satisfied customers said that they would gladly tell others about the businesses they love, yet fewer than 20% actually do. Why? Because they aren't asked. So first, make a list of five clients who fit your ideal model. They are delights to work with and understand your value and are willing to pay it. They have seen growth and have overcome obstacles with your help. Don't overthink this. A nagging chocolate craving is totally an obstacle if what you sell is cake. Then, plainly and undramatically, ask them for a testimonial, but be specific. Send at least three questions to get their minds moving. I recommend some of these. What are you proudest of about our work together? How did I help you evolve or grow? How did you surprise yourself during this process? What did you learn that blew your mind? What hesitation did you have before investing with me? And how quickly did you know that you were in the right spot? How did you get around the initial hesitation of hiring me? And what would you say to other people who are considering hiring me? Ask them to write it in the third person and to focus on goals and growth. And when you receive it, this is the kicker. Make sure you actually post the dang thing. It doesn't do you any good sitting in your email archive. Or, for bonus points, ask them to review you on a platform with discoverability like Google My Business or LinkedIn. This is really easy to do. They provide links so that it's two clicks and done. Remember, it's your praise. You've earned it. You don't have to be cocky about it. You don't have to flaunt it. You don't have to annoy your advisors. But you do have to act like the big freaking deal you were born to be and already are. Hey, thanks for listening. Too Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the non Sleazy Sales Academy and me, your host, Annie P. Ruggles. Listen, we talk a lot about marketing on this show, and that's because I fully, earnestly believe that every dime and every moment we spend marketing is totally worth it unless we turn around and sabotage ourselves at the finish by refusing to sell and sell beautifully. Why? 
a lot of us have a misconception of what selling actually requires of us or who it needs us to be. Please give me the opportunity to help change your mind at www.nonsleazy.com. That's N-O-N-S-L-E-A-Z-Y.com. Big shout out to the fabulous dudes who helped make this show what it is. My producer and editor, Andrew Sims of Hypable Impact. My composer, Riley Herbastio. And my show artist, Francois Vigneault. They're all fabulous and I'd be glad to introduce you. Until next week, just do your best. And remember, you're too legitimate to quit.